Women are better than men. How so? Just in general. Yeah. How so? Yeah. Because a woman- They have can, bigger tits. Yeah. Well, oh. well, why don't you say so? Why More sensitive you, titties. More, <laughs> not, well, not if you're a runner, <laughs> right? And you, you get got, those chapped nippies. Oh. Uh, do you, do you wear those things? For I've, your never had, uh, I've never had pasties. I never had. You know, like runners. <laughs> you want wear. me to wear some tassels? <laughs> no, but don't they have a I'll, product whatever for your runners? Fantasy is I'll wear whatever you want me to wear. A French maid outfit I, I and the Boston you. Marathon. I'm into it. I, I hate you. I hate you, I hate you both. So want much. some uh, role playing? <laughs> I could be the UPS guy. Oh, you don't like UPS? I'll be the FedEx guy. Okay. <laughs> I have your package in SEMA. <laughs> Uh, just be the milkman. Okay. The milkman's better. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got some heavy cream for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's raw, unpasteurized, <laughs> grass fed. That was good. <laughs> See, I know uh, how to talk dirty to you. Dude. Because we've known each other for so long. Dude, now. that was actually really, that was really good. Do I'll you be, have an erection? You know how to push uh, the buttons. It's, it's, it's a happy. It's oh, okay. Happy. okay. I got to get better. But you can't really tell. because I got to get dirtier. <laughs> <laughs> no what i was mentioning was i'll tell you guys uh my girl's in the gym and she sees this girl with like great tits and then she goes up to this girl and she's like you have such amazing tits what's the bra you're wearing and then the woman's like i got fake tits but i just think like i'm not wearing a bra i got fake tits right mm. but guys you know we don't go up to each other and be like hey dude your crotch your packages, looks good <laughs> your package is looking thick where'd you get those where'd you get those sweats or those shorts it's like could you imagine <laughs> We should, but <laughs> bro, I don't know if it's just the day or what's going on, but you look loaded down there, dude. Your ass is looking so great. Wait, in those did jeans. You get what a, brand is that? You get a pre pump before you walked in the gym. We Wait. should be able to do that with our homies, though. Andrew just like whenever he sees my ass, he just goes, "Whoa!" <laughs> well, dude, I was showing were, Andrew like a stretch one time, and he's like, "Wow!" Yeah, he's like, dude, you're at. <laughs> uh, no, you were on the uh, you were doing some like not, row? not seal rows, but yeah, you were oh, doing yeah. The, the regular bent over rows, and you just walk in, and it's just wham I'm like you guys like is anybody else sees i cannot be the only one and then i think Ensima walked in and he tried to film it <laughs> and then he finished his set <laughs> i remember this day oh mm -hmm. uh, this, this is on the daily for us yeah Ew. we got we got problems we do we should yeah. be able to talk more freely though like women i agree <laughs> right yeah doesn't always yeah. have to have a lot of reserve behind it. Women always be getting naked together too and have no problem with it. Mm. Although that's that's not where I want to go. I'm just saying, like, I'm in. Mm. I, it's so interesting how women do that. But it's it's it's. Don't you don't you think that's interesting? <laughs> I think it's, it's something. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all just leave me fucking flailing over here. I'm just like, help me, help me. <laughs> You're like one of those things with the arms <laughs> yeah. at the fucking car dealership or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> trying to reach for anything. That you get. Oh my god! Oh god, man! I've been uh, doing a lot of nasal breathing lately and on, mm. on my runs, and holy shit, that stuff is no joke. Brian McKenzie uh, has uh, given me some advices, and uh, we've imp been imp implementing some of that. And yesterday was hard. Two minutes uh, running hard, nasal breathing, and then uh, two minutes of just walking to try to calm down from the run. And it's kind of hard to figure out how to pace. And then I've also done it before where I'll run harder and jog and go back and forth between the two. But then it's hard to have much difference between the two because I don't have the capacity yet to go really hard. You know what I mean? And yep. I, I don't have the capacity to recover that well in between with a slow jog. When I walk and I run, it's a little little better, a little easier to manage. But, man, it is uh, – I, I think it's something that people should explore. I think people should work on it in their own way. You know, maybe just try 30 seconds or so. But what happens is, and, and do a couple rounds of it. So maybe 30 seconds of some nasal breathing, let's just say on like an Aerodyne bike. Mm -hmm. And don't go like, there's no reason to really sprint if you don't have that kind of, if you're not in that kind of shape. But just, you know, just uh, put in a good effort. You know, scale of one to 10, put in like a, a six or something. Um, pop off of there and walk for maybe a minute, maybe even 90 seconds still continuing to breathe in and out of the nose, hop back on there, go, you know, at a six or a seven again for 30 seconds, do that maybe like five rounds of that. What you'll find is you end up with like an accumulated fatigue 
and it, it's uh, you end up with some oxygen debt. So if you do one set of it, you're not going to really, you might be like, man, that was felt kind of difficult, but it's the accumulation over time. And I think it's the accumulation over time that gets us. Uh, and, and we don't even necessarily recognize it. Sometimes we don't realize how, how much fatigue has kind of built up in something. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of think that your workouts are only as good as your recovery. And when you do stuff like nasal breathing, it puts such a governor, such a limiting impact on your training in the beginning, um, that you don't have to think a lot about recovery. Recovery is kind of handled for you because you can't really do much yet. It's absolutely baked in. Um, I was talking like Smokey is starting jujitsu tomorrow. Oh, that's he awesome. has his first class of jujitsu tomorrow. Um, undefeated in judo, right? Yep. Undefeated. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Champion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's interesting is that like, you know, if you start jujitsu, if you start running or anything, if you can just build the habit of nasal breathing while you're doing these exercises, it is baked. It's almost like baked in recovery because you have a limit of how hard you can go. When you get to that point, um, you can just try to calm down, try to slow yourself down so you can keep within that. But you'll notice like you can come back and maybe do the same workout tomorrow or the next mm -hmm. day. You're not as beat up as if you went at a 10, started <laughs> huffing and puffing and really riled yourself up. And then you feel super beat up that you can't work out again for mm -hmm. a few days. It's, it, it's, and the cool thing with this too is I've been seeing a lot more people start talking about how beneficial mm -hmm. nasal breathing during different types of exercise can be. It's, it's a skill, but once, you, once it becomes habit, it will make such a big difference in terms of your overall output. Try it on a day where you're doing like accessory work in the gym. You're doing like arms and shoulders and stuff. <clears throat> Maybe it's not appropriate if you're trying to power lift and you're doing your bench squats and deadlifts because maybe you, you have a particular way that you breathe and I hate to see you hurt yourself if you're not used to it. So uh, maybe just do it with the assistance exercises, but just imagine uh, doing some step ups and in between you're doing some curls or something like that. It is really, really tough to manage. And of course, breathe, you know, whatever way you need to, to actually recover from it. So don't hurt yourself and don't pass out. Um, but get yourself to a point where you're like, holy fuck, man, this is getting to be really difficult for me. I have to like, I have to sometimes grab my nose because I'm like, man, I cannot, you know, the next thing is for me to, you know, uh, just start using my mouth, but I'll do that so I can really try to get good air in and out. And then plus I'm blowing snot everywhere and stuff. It's kind of <laughs> cold out and it's just, but you get over all that. You know, people ask a lot of questions about your nose being clogged and stuff. Once you start to practice this, you start to get around some of that. And I know there's a lot of people with like deviated septums and different conditions. So do so in whatever way that you can, but maybe over time, this is something that you develop and work on. Yeah, Smokey actually just texted me and said that he officially signed up. So congrats, Smokey. Yes, Good. Best of luck, you're going to love it. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, one thing for me it, early on, and I don't know when it stopped, but like I used to just like recycle snot. <laughs> like I would exhale and I would push some out and then I'd inhale and I'd suck it right back in my nose. And it just kept going over and over. But yeah, you're right. It, eventually it did kind of go away, but I don't know when it happened, but it did. But for those that are struggling, like how often do you implement strictly nasal breathing? Cause like they're still going to need to get their full on workout. And if they're not used to it, what does that look like? Okay. I would say like if you're doing your power movements and you're doing explosive stuff and breathe whatever way you're used to breathing. But uh, with assistance exercises, maybe just with walking, those would be really good places to start. And um, yeah, if you have to really bring something up to another level, mm -hmm. I don't think it's appropriate to start uh, nasal breathing there. I think you would, you would wait until you got used to nasal breathing. And then that's where you would try it, uh, you know, in jujitsu against someone that's better than you. But at first try it during the drills and stuff like that. And Seema has a lot of experience uh, with nasal breathing, especially in jujitsu. So maybe he can comment more on it. I don't know. I think um, it does like, you know, if you're doing a one rep max squat and you're used to breathing a certain way to get ready for that, that's fine because that's like one rep of a movement. That's going to take a few seconds. But if you're going through a full workout or if you're doing any type of cardio, you're doing jujitsu outside, I just say just dive in the deep end mm -hmm. and just try to keep your mouth shut for as long as you can. And then when you find yourself getting into the red zone where you're finally like, oh, I got to breathe through my mouth, slow yourself down. Literally, just, just <laughs> slow yourself down and get yourself back to the place where you're breathing again through your nose. Um, I know for some people, when it comes to jujitsu, like if you're doing multiple rounds of sparring, 
you might find like, okay, after my first round, I was breathing through my nose. Now I'm super tired. Now in my second round, I have to breathe through my mouth. Maybe during that second round, maybe you just don't go as hard to the point where you need to breathe through your mouth because you can always regulate the amount of effort mm. you put in. You can always regulate it. So if you find that you're now having to breathe hard through your mouth to do certain things, again, manually slow down and keep it through your nose, even if you're getting your ass beat. Because as you do that, as you get better at that, and as you get used to that, it's going to become a more natural thing to do. So I think people should just die off the, dive off the deep end with it. Mm. And it's going to be uncomfortable initially, as it should be if it's not something that you've been doing. Mm. But over time, like again, when I watch, some, when I watch the best guys do jujitsu, um, it's probably just something natural for them. But most of them, for a majority of the match, until like later in the match, their mouths are closed. Mm -hmm. They're breathing through their nose. They seem super chill. I was talking to you about this guy named Kanan Duarte, Andrew. He just looks so bored whenever he rolls. He looks, he's just like, the whole time. <laughs> looks like a fucking robot. But no one gets him out of his zone, and he's just breathing through his nose. No one probably mm -hmm. told him to breathe through his nose. But naturally, just by being that level of athlete, it's just something he does. Mm. Yeah, I think... Uh you know, nasal breathing had a huge impact for me so far, and I'm excited to kind of see what it can do. But Brian McKenzie, who used to do ultra marathons, and he works with a lot of runners, he has a lot of marathon athletes. They won't even, um, the furthest that they'll run is 14 miles mm -hmm. to be prepared to run 26 miles. And that's not anything new. That's not like Brian didn't like make that up. Like other people have done that before. But he's really, really a huge fan of nasal breathing. And if you go on his Instagram, he actually posted this and it's in some of his books. He has different gears that he talks about. Mm -hmm. He talks about gear one through four. Gear one is nasal breathing only. So maybe all you can handle in the beginning is doing that on some walks and periodically doing that occasionally on um, with some lifting. Uh, and then there's gear two, which is still in and out of the nose, but you're starting to get really close to the edge of uh, wanting to breathe in the nose, out the mouth. Gear three is in the nose, out the mouth. Gear four is just breathing whatever the hell way you can uh, because of you know what it is that you're doing. <clears throat> but I found it to be really valuable and I've been playing with it in a bunch of different ways and even got some advice more recently to when it's cold outside rather than to bundle up to like accept the cold and just be like, fuck it and just go out with no shirt or just a t-shirt like, intentionally be cold and go mm -hmm. run. Um, I think there's like a lot of things that you can do to amplify your own system. And we don't really think about it. I think our adaptation to cold is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why humans have survived for so long. Um, but if you think about it, what are these different things that we talk about every day? And what are the things that we've been preaching here at the power project for so long? We've been talking a lot about getting outside. We've been talking about getting sunlight. We've been talking about cold exposure, Cold exposure, sunlight, you might be able to knock those two things out um, in uh, by just going outside at certain times of day um, and and going on a run. So it's so the way that like my more modern thinking is, if I'm going to do a set of curls, well, I don't know, maybe I'll do a curl in like a slightly different position. You know, I, I don't need to necessarily have my feet squared up. Uh, maybe I can do, you know, one arm at a time, bilateral movement. And in between, I could do something, you know, more athletic. Because again, do I need more restriction with my body? Do I need my body to be tighter? And do I need my body to perform the way it used to? Or am I trying to create a new body? And if I'm trying to create a new body that does different things, I need to practice new habits. I need to, and and I need to get rid of a lot of those old, um, even if they were good habits, I need to distance myself from some of those things because th some of those things have been things that have, uh, kind of kept me tight, kept me uh, not as athletic as I'd like. So nowadays I'm trying to think, how do I couple things? How do I stack things together? How do I, well, you know, I'm just doing these uh, shoulder flies and I could easily walk outside a super training gym and get some sunlight while I'm doing these movements. So I'll just go outside with it. Or, and Seema does it all the time. He rolls the thing up goes out there and maybe he jump ropes or maybe you uh, end up sitting down with your laptop and now you're stretching. you got sunlight on you. Sometimes it's, well, it's been pretty cold. You're exposing yourself to the cold, the outdoor elements, and you're still answering emails and doing your other things. Yeah, and one thing that I started doing more recently uh, and uh, because I found it to be super helpful is I try every hour to do something to like, 
just move the body a little bit more than I was within that hour. So like usually we're always fidgety and we're always doing shit like, you know, this shit. But um, I'll try to at least make sure I do some push-ups or I get into some type of odd position with my body every single hour of the day that I'm awake um, so that I'm not just stagnant. Mm. Uh, and this can be something that's just like just do within the hour, just doing 10 push-ups. It could be as minimal as that or doing 50 or 60 or sitting down in a weird position. But I've found that my body is just feeling even better because it's like it's always greased up. Everything is always mm. lubed up. Um, and I'm trying to maintain that habit. Even while I'm at home, I have the uh, those base blocks things, like the parallel bars or whatever. So I'll go and I'll just like do a few pull-ups on it or just do a hang on it and just do that while I'm going through the day. Again, it's just the microdosing stuff that we've always been talking about, but it's minimal. But I think over time, that is going to compound into something bigger versus just having the time you have in the gym and just going in there and doing that for one hour of the day. Maybe you can split certain things throughout multiple parts of your day and get a much bigger effect compounding in the long mm -hmm. term. There is something also I want to mention about the nasal breathing gear thing that you were talking about. Um, the the cool the long term goal and the cool thing that's going to happen with your with your nasal breathing ability if you start doing this now is that your gear one right now is going to be pretty minimal. It's gonna it won't take long for you to have to open your mouth during cardio. But after a few months and then after a few years, your gear one is going to increase so much where you'll be doing something and let's just use jujitsu as context. You'll be rolling with people. And within the first minute, they're like, <gasps> and you're still chilling. Like you're still breathing through your nose. You haven't even put out any, you're not at that place where you're forced to output. When you're there, you're going to be able to recover so quickly from session to session. Because as everyone is struggling with breathing, you're breathing so good that you, you don't feel it. Hey, Pat Roger family, shut your f***ing mouth. No, nah, not, not really, but. Kind of. You should keep your mouth shut when you're asleep. Now, on the podcast, we've been talking about the importance of nasal breathing for years. And we've been talking about using mouth tape during your sleep for years as it's going to help your sleep quality because you're going to be breathing through your nose. We had James Nestor, author of Why We Sleep. Actually, that was Matthew Walker, but James Nestor, author of Breathe. We had Patch McEwen. Um, we've had so many people talk about the importance of taping your mouth and breathing through your nose when you sleep for your sleep quality, which helps your recovery, which helps every aspect of your health and fitness. So, Hostage tape. If you want to get some of this to help you sleep better and it also stays on your face if you're a bearded man, which is one of the big problems with mouth tape, head to hostagetape.com slash power project. And there you can actually get the power project annual deal, which will give you a year supply of hostage tape, 55 cents a day for tape pretty much. And you'll be able to save $150 along with getting two tins, a year supply of tape and a blindfold. That is going to be something that you want to get your hands on. Links in the description, along with the podcast show notes. Shut your f***ing mouth. I think it's something that could massively change so many aspects of your life because I try to implement it throughout the day with everything. Sometimes I'm on my phone and I don't know why, but I'll just like hold my breath or like I'm doing something and I'm like, that's weird. The fuck? Like, don't I want to relax a little bit? Like, what am I, what am I doing? So with this practice, I've noticed that, um, I'll get in situations where I might hold my breath. I don't know, maybe I'm in traffic or maybe I got frustrated about something and then I can just return to my breath and be like, oh, I, there's no reason for me to, to like stop breathing right now. There's no reason for me to like hold, uh, hold this position. I'm not trying to like fend anybody off. I'm not like in a fight. I'm not, I'm not lifting a weight. I'm not trying to brace myself. And so I think a lot of people will find that throughout the day, they're going to notice that they don't nasal breathe. And for the people that a lot of times there's a lot of comments from people and say they have their nose clogged or they have a busted nose. And again, we understand all those different situations, but just try it wherever you can. Mm. Uh, maybe, maybe for you, maybe you literally cannot do it during training. But uh, as we always say, we believe that you can improve upon it. So maybe it might take you a longer time for you to be able to do it in training. Uh, but uh, eventually you'll be able to work your way towards that. And one of the main reasons for that, one of the main reasons to practice nasal breathing is, is a it's a training load. So imagine if for lifting, imagine if like every gym only had, um, you know, 300 pounds to lift. Mm. That's, that's all you ever get to use. You get to use 300 pounds and you get to do whatever variations you want. Uh, and all it ever has is 300 pounds, which actually be really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's only like, you know, only goes up to like hundred pound dumbbells. Well, it's nice to have the variation and the option to be able to lift heavier. 
it's nice because you get a different training effect. You get a different training load. It's part of the reason why there's so many different training devices. There's a, uh, there's, you know, the free weights and then there's all the different machines and all the different things. It's so you can hit things from different angles and get a different training effect and different training load. And, and when you do nasal breathing, when you switch to only nasal breathing, it is a little bit akin to not the same as, but a little bit similar to um, you training at like altitude. It's, it's a way for you to get accustomed to some oxygen debt. And furthermore, a lot of people are, a lot of people deal with sleep apnea and or sleep interruptions throughout the night. They might not even have like clinical sleep apnea, but they wake up. Maybe they occasionally uh, have bouts of apnea and things like that. That really fucks up your CO2 to oxygen ratios massively. And you can get them back on track by practicing more nasal breathing during the day. So maybe you're somebody that has a hard time doing that when you rest because maybe your tongue falls back and maybe you have obstructed sleep apnea. Um, there's, many other reasons why that might happen, but you might be suffering from some of that in the six to eight hours when you're sleeping every night. And then you're also doing it during the day because you're not in shape or conditioned or aware. And you can start to practice it more and more during the day. And as we talk about with mouth tape, it kind of seems like when you use mouth tape a bunch that some nights when you forget to put it on or don't feel like putting it on, that you still continue to have restful sleep because you're getting used to having your mouth shut. So over time, the more that you use your nose, the easier and easier it's going to be to rely on it. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that's one thing I've been noticing. So I never really paid attention to where my tongue sits in my mouth, but like you were saying with like your breath, like you'll realize like, Oh, why am I holding my breath? Like, why is my tongue on the, like resting on the bottom of my mouth? Cause I've never, I've never paid attention to it. And now, so I'm really consciously trying to keep it locked in and up mm -hmm. high and tight because I had no idea. I had and no idea. If you don't know what we're talking about, we did an episode with Sandra Khan, who is the author of Jaws, and she talked a lot about the your oral posture and your face position. So check that episode mm -hmm. out because that's super important. If your tongue's at the bottom of your mouth, you're sleeping. You're sleeping on it. Or, or, or not sleeping not very sleeping. well at all because that's me. <laughs> yeah, I think there's important things to just develop some awareness around mm -hmm. and to pay attention to. And I noticed with myself, sometimes if I'm just like not paying attention to it, my tongue is like outside the bottom of my teeth. I don't know why. My mouth is closed, but my teeth are apart. And I wish I had the ability to ask the question uh, when she was here, um, but I did I. I didn't know about it because I didn't have that as much awareness. And I didn't really realize even with the mouthpiece that Dr. Gould made for me years ago, I didn't really understand exactly what it did. I knew it drew the bottom jaw forward, mm -hmm. but I didn't know it did anything with the tongue. And now when I use it, I can uh, get that negative pressure that she talked about, suction my tongue to the roof of my mouth. And my sleep is getting a lot better already just in a couple days since she's been here. But I find myself with, and uh, uh, Stuart McGill mentioned when he was on our podcast, he mentioned a lot of times before like a big lift and sometimes when there's like excitement and you're like about to go do something uh, that you end up with this big tongue. He mentioned it many times and, and I, I kind of knew exactly what he was talking about because I remember before some lifts when I was getting ready to lift, I would kind of notice my tongue would just be like, it felt fat. <laughs> my tongue felt really fat, but- I never even recognized or thought about it just in my day to day, like where my tongue is. And a lot of times my tongue is at the roof of my mouth. So that's kind of cool. But there's also a lot of times when it's not, and it's like almost like resting on like my bottom teeth. It's not at the, my tongue's not at the bottom, but um, she did mention, uh, was it her name? Sandra, right? Sandra. Yeah. She mentioned that um, I might have a small airway and, uh, I think that my tongue might be like too fat for the airway. And so it just kind of blobs out and just sits there. At least that's kind of what I'm speculating. I don't know. It's all, it's all just really interesting. And to be, to have awareness of this because we're trying to improve, we're trying to get better. We're trying to figure out better ways of getting better at everything, including uh, recovering from our workouts. And if you can't breathe well, you're not going to be able to recover great from your workouts. Yeah. And it's a free, e easy enough if you stay consistent it's a free easy fix right seriously mm -hmm. it's some, something you can literally do today and just do it every day mm -hmm. and you can start to mess around with 
all kinds of different shit and you can <laughs> get in that rabbit hole and look at like phalum gum and I know Ron Penna is still working on his gum. He's got he's got some cool stuff going on. I just on. bought five packs of fasting gum because I'm be chewing gum so much more now. Mm. Chewing, yep. chewing, chewing. Hopefully you guys don't hear it on the mic. I'm trying not to chew on the mic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, we got uh, some stuff talk to talk about, you know, in terms of like recovery. And you guys hear us talking a ton about, <clears throat> you know, we're standing here a lot of times barefoot and we're rubbing our feet on stuff and um, I've gotten more and more into myofascial release and the myofascial release stuff is interesting because it doesn't have to be explained all that much to runners. A lot of runners have foam rollers and they have a bunch of different things, but I still don't think that people really, really understand how important it is to recover from stuff and also the proper ways to recover from stuff. And on top of that, probably the most importantly is how to set up a training program and training regimen so that you don't need to spend a lot of time on recovery. You don't need to spend as much money on recovery and things like that. But some of your spend on recovery might be you getting with a good coach because the coach, uh, not only can they teach you the recovery tools and they might be able to give you some advice on how you can recover from stuff inexpensively by doing things like myofascial release. There's going to be a cost associated with having that coach uh, there's going to be a cost associated with even learning some of that knowledge. And some of that knowledge that you learn might be a gateway into inexpensive stuff like getting lacrosse balls and uh, the thing that we have that we we roll on our uh, calves and things like that. Like there's so many different things you can get for myofascial release. I have like stuff everywhere for this stuff because I have gotten into it. Uh, quite a bit. And I think it's really important. I actually just helped my dad last night. He just woke up one day and his Achilles was really hurting him. Mm -hmm. And so I just showed him something where he can uh, sit in his recliner, recline his feet. And so just while he's watching TV, it doesn't interrupt anything that he normally does. All he has to do is stick a softball underneath his calf and just rub his leg back and forth on there. And there's his like, you know, mm -hmm. former recovery. So, there's a lot of cool methods. There's a lot of cool things, but sometimes some of these things, they might cost you time. They might cost you money. And we have a clip from James Harrison uh, that we'll bring up where he talks about some of the cost. Yeah. The, the, the tough thing though, is like, for example, the myofascial release, man, it, it, people are very well-intentioned when they like, for example, they make content saying, oh, this doesn't really work well. It'll make you feel good. And if it makes you feel mm. good, go out and do it. But it doesn't actually work or the research doesn't show that it works. Mm. And there's a lot of people who are still kind of saying that type of stuff when it does come to myofascial release. Oh, it's just something that not researched, but if it makes you feel good, go ahead and do it. And that'll make some people not really, I guess, take the plunge into trying that out for themselves for a decent amount of time and seeing what it can do. And that's just, that makes it tough on people because everyone wants to figure out what's going to work well, but I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because we can, we have felt and we know mm -hmm. how well it works also, and the, the big thing is like, we're not just sitting around doing nothing, trying things. Mm -hmm. Like you're putting your body through a lot. I'm putting my body through a lot. So there's a lot of wear and tear and we can tell when something is making a difference mm -hmm. on that wear and tear. But I think that, um, I think that, yeah, people do want like science sometimes to back things up and, and things like that. But if you've ever had active release therapy done by someone that knows what they're doing, um, or you even just take it upon yourself to perform your own form of active release, all you would really be doing, again, let's just take the calf as an example. You lay down on the ground. You, you, uh, I'm sorry, you sit on your butt. You put your leg on top. You, you put your calf on top of a ball. You take your other leg and put your leg on top of that, and you squish on that calf where you might have, uh, I don't know, a tendon problem or like it feels like you have something with the Achilles or something with the calf that bothers you. Roll around on that thing for two minutes or so. And as you're doing that, move your foot up and down. That would be a form of active release therapy and a form of myofascial release. Active release is the, the active part of it is just that not only is somebody moving through the area that's bothering you, you're also moving your body in a particular direction. That that movement is going to allow the freedom of you to gain access to um, kind of what was bothering you, what was kind of triggering your body to stay stuck in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it will help get rid of that adhesion. 
And if you're due to do like MRIs and stuff like that, I don't think these things show up. You can do MRIs and x-rays and sonograms and probably do anything you want. And you probably won't see, oh my God, like, look at that thing. It's in the calf. You're not going to, it's probably not going to find it, but there is some scar tissue there. There is some damage there or whatever it is. It's something that you can kind of relieve from the area and you can start to move a lot better. You can do a lot of this by yourself. But if you've ever had somebody actually work on you and do it, it's a little different because you get to relax your whole body a little bit more, even though what they're doing might be pretty intense. I would say 50% of it is skills. The other 50% is health. 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 Stay healthy. Stay healthy. You got to be able to stay healthy. The older you get, the easier it is for you to get hurt. Sure. The longer it takes you to recover. So the biggest thing that I did is I spent a lot of money on building and recovering from workouts, training, games, all that. You know, I would spend anywhere from, you know, three to five hundred thousand dollars a year on my body recovery, workout treatment and all that so that I was able, you know, to play as long as I did. My body that's an is investment. my business. That's is exactly that's an investment. If I tell you right now, I say, hey, man, you know, give me four hundred thousand in a year. I'm going to give you five, ten million back. You Great drop. investment. Exactly. A lot of guys can't see that because, oh, that's just so much money. But the same guys that can't see that and, and invest in that in their body will go to Vegas and drop 20000 James Harrison, one of the best to ever do it, played for the uh, played for the Steelers, got a lot of coaching from uh, Ian Danny, who's somebody that we've had on the podcast before. And James Harrison has those legendary workouts where you see him running with bands on him and, and pushing uh, pushing a prowler with like a world record weight. I don't think anybody's ever pushed more weight. He's got like, I don't know, 16, 45 pound plates stacked up on each side of this thing. Jeez. Absolute monster, um, extremely strong, uh, underrate, underrated. Uh, I don't believe he was like really drafted or I, I don't think anyone ever really took him all that seriously. And that's why he took, that's why he took everything so seriously and why he pushed so hard. I want to say that he was like, um, I don't know, like 5'10", which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily short, but it's not tall uh, for the NFL. And most of the people that play his position, um, you know, good luck trying to get a position uh, being 5'10 in the NFL. It, it usually doesn't happen, but James is somebody that uh, he did ev everything and anything that he possibly could to not only stay on the team, but to also end up being a Hall of Fame player. And the thing that he said, where he said his body is his investment, that's not something that is exclusive to a top-level NFL player or a LeBron James who spends millions of dollars on his body a year. That's everybody. Every single person, no matter if you're an athlete or not, if you have a family, if you are, if you fucking make pots for a living, or if you work in tech for a living, your body is your investment. Because at the end of the day, as you get older, if you're not taking care of things, things will begin to degrade. And you won't be able to do things the same way as you did when you were 10 years younger, 15 years younger. Some people might say, oh, that's how it is for everybody, but that's not how it is for the people that take the time to invest and take care of their body. They'll still be doing things at a high level when they're 50, 60, 70. We've seen these people and we know these people, but if you don't treat your body like an investment and you just treat it like you, 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 you spend more time focusing on other things than your health, and I, I get it, everyone has different priorities, but if you do that, few years down the line, you might not be so happy that you did. Mm. And James Harrison is probably somebody that's like 45 years old, maybe maybe closer to 50. I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of people in America that are between 45 and 50. <clears throat> and uh, they didn't play 10 years in the NFL. He played like 10 years in the NFL. That's a long time for the NFL, right? It's, it's insane. Hmm. It's insane for him to have played that long and for him to still be very healthy. And that's kind of my point is that he did something that was really stressful. He put his body through a lot and there's a lot of people who haven't really done much with their body and it's great to investigate it. And it's great to start to, you know, start to work out, start to try to strengthen yourself. And there are going to be things that you have to pay for. We see it time and time again. We, we recommend Piedmontese beef. We recommend all these things because uh, sometimes people are like, well, I don't like to have too much uh, red meat because red meat has too much fat. And mm -hmm. we're like, solution, boom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could be, uh, you know, something with the feet. You know, we've been talking all this stuff about the feet. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a hammer toe or I have a bunion or I have 
Vivo barefoots are great. Oh my God, they're so expensive. Like it's the first <laughs> thing that you see. And we understand that. Um, I, for many years was, was very broke. Um, but even when I was broke, I always thought of ways, how do I, how do I do my own version of that? Like what, you know, okay, I don't have five grand laying around. Sorry, I don't have five grand laying around to, to get a cold plunge. That would be awesome to have one. Um, but like, what would my own version of that be? Well, Wim Hof says you can just change the fucking shower temperature. Oh. I have a shower. I can do that for a while. So, you know, what are your own versions of it? If you see that uh, certain things are expensive, certain cuts of meat, oh, it must be nice for that guy. He eats a filet every day or whatever. Maybe you can't afford the filet. There was years where I was buying those big giant tubs of, uh, those big giant tubes rather oh, of yeah. beef. <laughs> you know, that you can get them at Costco. It's like a giant like log. <laughs> just do what you can afford and do what you can do currently. We're not ever trying to necessarily uh, say that you, Hey, you have to do it this way, but protein leveraging some of the things that we advise you to do um, the mouth tape. If you don't want to spend the money on it, maybe there's some other version of that that you could figure out that's more affordable, whatever the hell it is, whatever it is, you know, try to figure out your own way of getting it done because these things are of tremendous value. There are, aspects though like for example lebron spends millions on his body a year when i see that i'm like well it makes sense the guy is like a billionaire but does he really have to because uh, the reason why i wonder that is like okay i get it and we don't know everything but we talk to a lot of people and we're doing a, a lot of pretty cool shit for our bodies and it's definitely not close to a million dollars you're not even not even a fraction of that right so i wonder what is lebron doing like, like what's yeah. what's like i know okay you know what actually maybe he just is a huge tipper personal <laughs> chef probably costs a lot of money mm -hmm. to make all your meals all the time to travel with you you probably have a co it makes sense actually that was a stupid question I well it it, it uh <laughs> I, I get it. it it makes sense if you actually start to break down anything and mm -hmm. you really, really break it down, um, the, the truth of stuff really hurts a lot. Uh, Joel Green in his book, The Immunity Code, he says it takes four hours to be fit. It takes four hours a day to be in the shape that you want to be in and to have the body that you want to have. And I was like, man, that's wild. Then he broke it down and he said why he said four hours. And he's like, how long does it take you to cook? How long does it take you to go to the grocery store? How long does it take you to drive to the gym? How long does it take you to drive back from the gym? How long is your workout? To, you know what I mean? And when you start to really walk through all these things, oh, how many hours a week does it take to be a great jujitsu practitioner? Uh, you might be like four. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. No, four automatically turns into like eight because there's like a, you know, some prep going there. You're watching it uh, on video. Um, you're on your, on the phone, talking to your friend about it. You're talking to your coach after class, like these things, they really, really add up. And so it's no wonder the average person says, I can't afford to do that. I, I don't have the time for that. While we don't like to use time as an excuse, it actually is a fairly legitimate. Um, but things <laughs> do what you can afford. What I mentioned in the beginning, do what you can do for now and you can work towards these things later. Andrew, I was just, Andrew had to take a shit real quick. <laughs> I was just saying uh, how Joel Green said uh, it takes four hours, you know, mm -hmm. to be fit, four hours to do. And Joel Green has always tried to find hacks to make that shorter. That's why he's a crazy person. You know, run, he'll sprint for 20 seconds down the street randomly because mm -hmm. he's ta figuring out ways to kind of microdose his fitness and to implement things slightly differently. But the reason why he says four hours is because there's so much time committed to the meals, the mm -hmm. meal preparation, driving to the grocery store and all those things. And so all these things have to be accounted for when we're thinking about, you know, our recovery from our workouts and how long these things take. But if you do have the luxury to spend any money on stuff, sometimes the money can sometimes buy you time. Occasionally it can buy you time. Again, uh, spending money to have someone program for you. Now I don't have to think about it at all. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be frozen when I go to the gym. I don't have to like not know what I'm going to do. It's already spelled out for me. It's going to be easier for me. Uh, meal prep, I'm going to use Icon Meals and, and have them make the food for me. It's frozen. I throw it in the microwave. Boom, it's done. Things and, like that. And what's the lower version of spending money on having someone to make a program specifically for you? 
if you're trying to get in better shape, maybe you just go and find a program that mm -hmm. you can do and just modify it a bit for the things you like to do. Ben Patrick's program is literally 50 bucks a month, right? But maybe mm -hmm. you just take a look at it in month one and then not, <laughs> and then just like write things down and mm -hmm. do things for yourself. Or you go to any person, grab their program and just modify it for yourself, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of ways where you can scale down what other people are doing and make it work for your lifestyle, your budget, whatever you're able to do. But then there's also like with some of these things, maybe like, cause I remember when I was in college and I wanted to be able to, you know, eat certain foods to help me be able to like eat a good amount of protein. Right. I had to budget a bit more. I had to be a bit better with my money so I could afford the food I wanted to eat to be able to do the things I wanted to do. So you might have to take money from certain things that you might be wasting it on and put it towards things that might help you in the long run. It sucks, but it's just, it, it's sometimes something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, as somebody, like you know me and Seema, like oh, I'm, you are frugal I am a little frugal. <laughs> um, but like what I've learned, like the really hard lesson this I know a lot of people have done this, but like, you know, uh, sometimes when you take the cheaper route, you end up spending way more. So as silly as it sounds, spending a little bit more will actually save you a lot more down the road. Um, yeah. We were just talking to Smokey again, right before the podcast about what ghee to get. We explained, just go and get an origin ghee and like call it a day because there's a lot of dudes that you'll see wearing, um, I won't say the company, but like it's a very popular company on Amazon. Because I had Fuji Geese. Fuji's that fine. Ripped. I think Fuji's good. It's good, but they ripped, and then that's so, why I got Borgin. So, but exactly. So you had to buy two when you could have just bought the one. Yeah. And it's like one, yeah, it's just going to save you money that way, but also the time. Like, what if you now, well, I mean, I guess you can get a loaner gi, but like, there's still going to be that shipping period where you have to wait for the next one to come in. So I'm using a gi as an example, but like, I've done this with shoes. I've done this with supplements. I've done this with clothes, a fuck ton of clothes. Yeah. Trying to look better and it comes out and it's like four times smaller than what the picture said, you know, cause it's like a cheaper brand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can, you can find certain things that are like, like they call them like dupes or whatever, but can't really dupe a, a workout program. You know, sometimes you just got to like, and then the other thing too is like, uh, you, you find the, the bend over tees, uh, bend over knees program, right? <laughs> like it's not the knees over toes. It's the bend over knees uh, or whatever it may be. And you're like always going to question like, damn, is this as good as it, as it could be? Like, dang, I don't know. And then you spend more time wondering and comparing and trying to you know, hack the system and find like somebody else that posted it on the internet or something when you can just go pay the 50 bucks, get it done. And then, you know, whatever, save a bunch of stuff to your Google drive. <laughs> Sometimes I uh, hear people, they're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going, you know, from where I live to like, I'm going to go to Woodland and go to Costco. I'm like, you just drove past like four or five grocery stores on your way there. <laughs> Those are more expensive. Well, it takes you a lot more time. Like <laughs> I'd rather just, hit this place up that's close to me when I need to periodically rather than make this giant haul. You know, it's, again, you got to do what you think is best for you. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Um, however, <laughs> t time is, time is money and money is time. And I think like food is money, you know, food is, yes. it's a, a way to look at food. Food is money, but food is also time as well. Lots of time. The, 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 uh, the less cautious you are with your food, and the more unhealthy, he's talking about health, the more unhealthy your food makes you, the more time it takes you to unwind that whole thing. Yeah. The more time you're going to spend on a treadmill, the more time you're going to spend running, the more time you're going to spend doing some a bunch of exercise just to probably get you balanced out so you're not continuing to gain weight. You could be, there's like a lot of things that if you start to really examine them, you're probably wasting a lot of time and wasting a lot of money you could probably just uh, do the thing that's a little bit more convenient and a little bit more expensive, but you probably don't realize it yet. And I've referred to this as having a broke mindset. Your, your mindset is not, it has too much of a governor on it. You're kind of stuck in your previous thoughts. And again, it's understandable to have scarcity. Like, you know, people have horrible shit happen uh, when they're children. They have, you know, parents leave, they have, uh, divorces, there's, there's deaths, there's all kinds of shit that happens that mm. is totally understandable for you to have it kind of programmed into you that you're concerned about 
your money and you're trying to really have a budget. It all makes tons of sense. Uh, however, I do think that there's a, a real value to paying for stuff sometimes. And so you have to kind of wonder like how, like how into this are you, you know, do you want to go to this jujitsu school that they just like, you know, they have, they have everybody there and they have like fitness classes and all these other things going on. And it's like 20 bucks a month or whatever. Where do you want to go to this, like this instructor who is really teaching class, who has a bunch of great teachers and instructors under him and the place is, you know, 150 bucks a month or something. So, you know, there's, you're going to, sometimes you're going to be paying for much better quality. And as Andrew's pointing out, a lot of times you want to just do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Pat Project Family, how's it going? Now, we talk about sleep all the time on the podcast because it's one of the biggest things that helps you with your health and fitness, your recovery, your muscle gain, your fat loss, everything. That's why we've partnered with 8Sleep for such a long time now because the technology behind the mattress allows you to track your heart rate, the amount of times it takes you to fall asleep, your tosses and turns, your heart rate variability. It changes its temperature through the night based off how you sleep, but not only yourself, but maybe your partner on the other side of the bed. It is an amazing mattress. Andrew, how can they learn more? Yes, head over to 8sleep.com slash power project. That's 8 spelled out, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash power project. Along with more information, you guys will actually save $150 off of your entire order automatically. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. I can't let you get away with the Costco disc, though. <laughs> like, as, as uh, uh, man, <laughs> but Costco, you when you can get, like, 16 rolls of toilet paper oh, and yeah. 12 things of paper towel where you go to Rayleigh's or Target and yeah, fuck those places. You're getting four. <laughs> Costco, you're getting 12 and it's good quality. Costco, I get what you were going for, but man, Costco. Yeah, but Costco. I like Costco. But then you get to you get to Costco and you're going to get the, the, the toilet paper and I'm going to get a rotisserie chicken and some other shit. And yeah. then you walk by and like, well, okay, I guess Valentine's Day's coming. I'll get the strawberries too. And it's like, well, shit, I, think, I want uh, this. They and have that. cheap flowers for all the guys like and nice cheap yeah, flowers. Yeah, like 20 bucks. Yeah. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> this is like way off topic. No, it's I think everything's a trick, you know? <laughs> I think everything... Yeah. Like when people are like, oh, you know, I make like a hundred grand at my job and then I, you know, have a company car, I got insurance and they put so much value in all that stuff. It's like, you can own your own car your own way. You don't, you don't need to be, uh, working for that company necessarily. And you don't necessarily need them to pay for insurance. You can pay for your own insurance. And I think we put so much value in these things. We put so much value in, but they're all... <laughs> They're all kind of an illusion. Costco is the greatest illusion, illusion of all time. <laughs> okay, let's go. And Walmart and all these places. They're uh -huh. well. Hey, come in. Costco hey, and Walmart are different. Hey, things. guys, come in. Like everything's inexpensive, and we have really large things that you get in these, you know, in great quantities. And you're going to walk out with this amazing, uh, this amazing like plethora <laughs> of stuff, you know. But as Andrew pointed out, you're going to buy way too much shit. You're going to buy way more stuff than you need to. You're not going to mm -hmm. just buy what's on your list. Must be disciplined. They already know that. Must They're be. getting you with the $4 rotisserie chicken. They mm -hmm. have like lost leaders in there and yep. stuff like that. Yep. Kind the of drag $10 you pizza. That's and like, then you're like huge. Oh yeah. my God. You look at that. They got a TV for $400. That's <laughs> fucking awesome. You know oh, how they deliver it right to my house. We and need you know, one of just, those. The game's just, coming up. Oh, if the game's coming. We got to get some beer too. Like we're already here. <laughs> the amount of Costco baskets you see filled up to here, it's like, oh, dude. okay, they, they, they know how to get the hoarders. That's it, yeah. And many people are hoarders who wouldn't. I like, like loading up. I think it's kind of <laughs> great. I love getting like a bunch of eggs and shit. Like Fuck I kind of, yeah. I kind of dig all that. Mm -hmm. Cause it like, I don't know, you would just, especially as like a lifter, you always think that you're going to be like running out of stuff. Like I need all this protein. <laughs> it's like, you got like months and months of fucking protein. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, what are you doing? Most of this stuff's going to go bad or be in your freezer for ever. Mm, yeah, you know? that's the fuck, dude. No more vegetables. Like I already told my wife, like we have like too many, too, too many shelves already full of vegetables that we're never going to touch. They've been there since like pre pandemic. Like they're not going anywhere, <laughs> but nothing ever has made me feel like such a baller than when I walk in and I get the, you know, like the organic eggs, the big, you know, boxes of it at Costco and everyone's looking at the damn, that's expensive. It's like six bucks for like that, you know, the regular white ones. And they're like standing there stressing like, oh, how much is that per? And I just walk in, I grab two because the limit is two. If it wasn't, I would grab more. I grab that and just walk out. Don't even look at the price because I'm like, I'm, I need this. I have to have these eggs or else I'm kind of fucked because yeah. I eat two things. I eat steak and eggs. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's all I do. But you know, then I look back and it's like, oh, they're, they're 20 bucks right now for, I think it's like 60 of them. Mm-hmm. 
it's still an insane deal. But when you look at it, it's like, oh man, they used to be like ten dollars, now they're twenty. Ooh, I can't swing that. But meanwhile, your card is full of you know some shit that you're never gonna use. It's it's so silly the way we do look at things. I was gonna say though, like when it does come to your egg thing, like all right, the eggs are a little bit expensive, but you're spending money on eggs and some other things, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of other people might be spending money on just like kind of shit food that mm -hmm. adds up to. Uh, more than what those eggs are, right? Oh, yeah. So you're saving money. Oh, uh, you're saving, saving money by weight. buying those eggs. And, and we're talking about time. I know what breakfast is always going to be like, and I know what dinner is always going to be like. It there's no. It's like one. I save one of those valuable decision making things, you know, throughout the day, or save two, I should say. And then yeah, it, it saves a shit ton of time because also in the grocery store, we're not jumping around, you know, left and right. Oh, we forgot the. You know, the bacon that's supposed to go with the eggs or we forgot this, we forgot that. Mm. It's like, no, we just go straight to the fridge and then we go straight to the toilet paper because that's usually what we're doing at Costco anyways. Yeah. And then we're out. What do you guys think about, like, just in terms of more like what James Harrison was talking about? And um, have you guys spent money on, sounds like you guys have spent money on a bunch of different things uh, in regards to sports. I know you had like a, some, you had a surgeries, I think, on your on your foot, right? For soccer. Yeah. And like, there's like a lot of things to where it's like, um, who, who knows where we're going to end up with something? Who knows, you know, how good we'll be at something. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent tons of money, uh, on powerlifting equipment and, and seminars. And I mean, just so many things. And those were all, it was all, um, the word sacrifice is like way too large of a word, but I can't think of another one. Mm -hmm. It's sacrificing for the unknown. You know, I, I didn't know what was ever going to happen. I had no idea, but I knew that I loved it. And I always wanted to figure out how can I do this? And I did figure it out a lot of times when I didn't have money. So what are some things that you guys had to spend some money on uh, over the years that, um, you know, where you maybe had to spend quite a bit? Uh, I can jump right on into this pretty quickly. Um, my photography gear, when I first started, you know, everybody starts with like a, a kit lens and the you know the thing that comes with the camera it's it's all pretty cheap but it's like well hey i got this and then you try to with, with like people that are broke that don't or not broke that just like me i was young so i didn't have enough money to buy an actual like legit lens so we would get old lenses and adapt them to the new cameras and it was all like manual focus manual aperture manual everything mm -hmm. which is fine because now that's how i shoot but the image quality just wouldn't be as nice because it's an old dirty lens or something. And you can get super duper high quality ones. Some would argue that the old ones are significantly better than the new ones. But it wasn't until I bought like a brand new camera and a brand new lens where I started one, I started taking the shit seriously, but also people started taking my imagery way more seriously because it, you can just tell it looked different. And I'm not saying you need like the best gear to take great pictures, but holy shit, did it help? Mm. And so I spent years of like buying old lenses and buying adapters and buying like uh, fake batteries and all kinds of dumb shit uh, uh, software and stuff when I could have probably just got like a quality lens right from the get go and skipped all of that. Part of it was very fun because you're like, you know, searching on Craigslist for old lenses. You're going to uh, yard sales and stuff, hoping that somebody has like an old Canon, you know, AE1, you know, setup. But, um, I would trade all of that fun for just getting the job done right the first, you know, the first time around. I want to point out something I think is real important is that you, you paid money for stuff. It didn't work great. And then you probably learned a lot more. Like you learned a lot in that process. You learned a, the thing that you bought is shitty. B, you probably started to investigate more and you started to look, uh, whether it's on the internet or talking to friends or whatever. And you learned so much more about these other products and then you learned like how to use those products. Like you became more skilled by purchasing. Like a lot of times it's it's a purchase of something that gets you better at something. You pay someone to teach you uh, the piano and they teach you the piano. Maybe you find out that that teacher is not even that good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you play the piano in front of people and they're like, you're not like, <laughs> you thought you've been learning for a while and you're not as good as you thought or you post it and people are making fun of it, but you, you learn from that process. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're like, well, my instructor, they're not that bad really, but I should learn from other people as well. Then you go and look it up on YouTube. Then maybe you take an online course or class or whatever it is. And there's so many different routes you can start to go. But what I've learned over the years is that when I pay for something, 
I'm expecting it to do something for me. You're expecting it to work. And that is a like a lo- loaded word because nothing ever really like works <laughs> for you. You have to like work with it, mm-hmm. and, right? And, and you got to do your own work. Your, you know, it's it's not just gonna it's not gonna just fix your problems. We think that like an item or a product is gonna like fix everything mm-hmm. for us, and it it never really truly works out that way. Um, How many people have bought exercise equipment yeah, that they haven't shit. fucking touched? Yeah, right. It's like they used it one day or two days, and then it's been collecting dust. It, it, that's the, uh, the clothes all hanger the, yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time, and I and I think that. Uh, the initial investment though is great. Even though you don't use it, you still may have learned something about yourself. You may have learned, man, I only really work exercise hard when I go to a gym. Then you buy like a kettlebell, you buy a bunch of other stuff at your house and it still just sits there. You thought that you would do that. And you're like, I got all this stuff here and I don't, so you, but you learn and hopefully you learned that this is how I do my best. And this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. I think it all comes down like that. That's why it just comes down to like you yourself have to change because like I have a lot of exercise stuff at home that I use, right? But it's very easy for you to get certain things that you're like, oh, this is going to make the difference, but you don't do that. You don't do your part in trying to make it different. Mm-hmm. It just it it just sits there. Um, recently, like I, I've been going over to Kyle's in San Jose and training over there because there are people over there that can push me. And that costs money. Like the train there is 80. The train back is 80. There's Ubers I need to get to get around, right? So it adds up to probably more than upwards of $700 a month. The train is a really good example. The train is so much better to take. You can have your laptop. You could have your headphones. You could listen to podcasts. You could journal. I can actually get stuff done on it. So it's not- way different than you sitting in traffic. Way different. Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's worth- in this case, it's like worth the money because mm-hmm. you can have you can have forms of self improvement. Think about stuff for the podcast, or think about stuff for jujitsu, or wherever you want to expand yourself in. Uh, yeah, learning, I was that reading. blowing your guys' phone up when I'm on that train. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like you see yeah. Text line. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's you know, and and maybe look, and, and also maybe a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Like sometimes sometimes you're not in line. Sometimes you don't have the luxury to do certain things, and that's okay, and that's fine you do what you think you can afford at a particular time. I remember going to seminars and the seminars would be looking back on it. The seminar would be so inexpensive for what I learned. I want people to really embrace this idea. Like what if this thing, what if this uh, seminar, this thing you're going to learn this uh, product, what if it's going to change your life forever? What if it's something that leads to this snowballing effect of you? Cause sometimes a product can be like exciting. Oh, yeah. um, and we've heard oh, yeah. the testimonies of people with a cold plunge. I, I've never personally suffered with depression or, or things like that, but we've I've seen and heard so many people talk about the impact that cold therapy can have. Mm-hmm. And so some people are like, yeah, man, I said, fuck it. And I bought a cold plunge and it made a huge difference. Um, now, again, can you find your own less expensive way of doing that? Can you, can you uh, just experiment with that in the shower here and there and see, uh, see the impact of it yeah i'm sure you could and you can say well i think that will make a difference i think i am gonna and and you can go on youtube and you can look at these different ways to construct your own Mm -hmm. version of a cold plunge or if you know you have you have a friend that has a pool you can use their pool in the winter time and shit like that you know you can there's always ways to kind of figure out less expensive ways but i am a huge fan of actually paying for it because i think that when you pay for it that you're going to more than likely invest some time in trying to figure out what the next steps are after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it comes to my back, I would try buying like devices or like creams and stuff to try to like alleviate some of the pain. Uh, The the funniest one I I bought was like a, and it's like floating somewhere around here because I actually let Josh Setledge use it. And I was like, you can just keep it because I'm not even using it anymore. But it's like a back stretcher. So you lock your your ankles into it Mm. and then you lock your head into it and you just crank and it just like decompresses you. Jesus. So it actually felt pretty damn good and seemed like you'd probably be too big for it. Like just, yeah. He'd break it. Yeah. It's just, it was like a cheap little hundred dollar thing, but like. When I got it, that like hundred dollars was kind of you know, kind of a lot of money, and I was just like hoping that it would work. And I'm like, God dang it! Like I should have just 
I don't know, went and paid somebody to, to work on me. Same thing with like chiropractors be like, Oh, which ones accept my insurance? It's like, Oh, mm. this guy over here that fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. But I keep going back to him just because like, Oh, he's going to crack me and make me feel good. But it just, it, it didn't work until I started like really digging in and learning from, you know, everyone we've had on the podcast, learning from you guys and like paying people to do body work or ART on me. Um, and that's been like super beneficial. So yeah, paying an actual person versus trying to buy something, uh, that like a gimmicky thing. Now I'm not saying like we do use a ton of tools, but I was like going about it the wrong way. Yeah. And I think also maybe, like there's a consistency thing to it too, man, because like, mm -hmm. you know, you could go and don't, don't get me wrong. I think it's good. Like I go to Oscar every now and then. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and Oscar's great, but if somebody gets like Kelly Stretz supernova or that RX roller thing we talked about or any type of hard thing and they start venturing into learning how, like you mentioned buying that functional patterns thing so people can learn different mm -hmm. ways of using that stuff. But if you take the time to learn how to like just roll in all these places and really utilize that pressure, the difference it'll make is huge. But the thing is, is, is it takes, it takes effort and it takes you doing mm -hmm. something. And there is a side of it where it's like uh, the one day a week where you go and you see someone to do work on you, you'll feel good. But then are you doing things on your own for the rest of that time? Mm -hmm. And you got to be like, you have, like we, we're doing this stuff every single day. That's why we're feeling so good. But you know, when you fall off, things start to creep in, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it, all of it still takes effort. You can't expect something to just work if you don't do the work. And James Harrison, you know, he's got access to some of the best in the world. He's work, working with uh, Ian Danny. But I think that even for your average person who doesn't have that money, because he mentioned the investment side of things, yeah. where he's like, he probably didn't think that way when he was younger. You know what I mean? He probably didn't think that way when he was younger, but he still did it. He still yeah. figured out a way to do it because he recognized the importance of it. And in this case, we're not talking about playing in the NFL, but we are talking about your life. We are talking about um, how you're going to be able to live the rest of your life. So paying for gym memberships, like a lot of these things can be annoying. Sometimes paying, like a gym membership usually isn't too crazy. There's very affordable ways to yeah. train. But there are, you know, like boot camps and there are uh, like personal training. The CrossFit gyms are a little more expensive. But again, like what if that changes your life? What if you walk into a CrossFit gym and what if you fall in love with it? Mm -hmm. What if you train there for a, a couple months and you meet a significant other? I mean, there's like so many things that can happen once you start to kind of venture. We hear it all the time. We've had people on the show before where... We're like, hey, how did this all get started? And I walked into a CrossFit gym and I met so and so, and then we we teamed up and we started our own business and we started coaching people and you know now they're off like doing something amazing. So I do realize that sometimes these things can be expensive, sometimes they can be time consuming, uh, but I think it's worth it. It's worth it to give these things a shot. And I think a lot of times on my social media, there's a misunderstanding. I think people think. Like, oh, Mark's on to the next thing. Oh, look, he's, you know, now he, he went from the Gota guys. He went from Sturette to Gota to this thing to that thing. And they keep thinking that I'm like jumping from one thing to another. And while that may seem that way, but I still love the stuff from Kelly Sturette. I still utilize stuff from Kelly Sturette. And while I'm here doing some functional pattern stuff, and while I have powerlifting maybe in the past, I still utilize stuff from powerlifting. I still utilize powerlifting techniques. I'll always love powerlifting. It's ac actually that I just created a larger network rather than a smaller one. I'm not, I'm not trying to stay within one thing, keto, carnivore, all these different things. There's still things I really, really believe in. I still love a ketogenic diet. I've done a bodybuilding style diet. So you've seen me move from each thing. I'm not moving from each thing because I'm distracted or because I have ADHD or <laughs> or whatever the case is, I'm moving from each thing to try to continually find stuff that's better. And I want to experience it for myself. What is this about? I'd like to figure this out. Does this really work? Go to like twisting your heel out when you <laughs> walk and run. Why does my heel, my heel doesn't do that. It goes the opposite way. The fuck are these guys talking about? David Weck, he seems like he's crazy. <laughs> Let me figure out what he's talking about. Head over foot. 
Is that really what everybody does? You think 30 year old you would have been just like bench press? Just bench press. <laughs> just fucking bench press. No, I've I've always I've always been into a lot of different things. I mean, I would have probably just bench pressed uh myself, but I I I always was fascinated mm-hmm. by some of this stuff. And when people would bring up certain things, I mean, this whole thing about the jaw and mm-hmm. the, the book Jaws. Yeah. And we're going to have a woman come on the show, a posture pro who, who talks a lot about the eyes and the connection to the jaw. And when you start to go down these, you start to go down some of these paths and you kind of realize so much of it starts with the feet because <laughs> our feet are uh, kind of, the, our feet are always protected. We don't get outside. We don't step on the grass. If you watch your dogs go outside, when they go on the grass, like it's very specific. It's almost like they're little computers and their their paws and everything will touch the grass. The grass is either wet or cold or dry. That registers in their mm. system somewhere. The dog never just goes outside and pees. The dog goes outside and it fucking looks all around and shit. Yep. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and the dog is very aware, right? The dog sniffing and shit. Like the dog wants to make sure no one's gonna fuck him up while they're going to the bathroom, right? Like they're not going to just run outside like we would because we're fucking stupid, (laughs) but they're smart and they have a lot of senses and they're still uh, in contact with a lot of those senses. So the ground gives an animal information, but it also gives us information. We don't have that same information anymore and it can negatively impact a lot, a lot of stuff for us. So I don't know. I just, I think all of this stuff is fascinating. I'm going to continue to always keep looking and looking and looking, looking for stuff, not, not looking for the next best thing, but looking for things to continue to add to the power project. That's why it's a project. This is a never ending project. Yeah. Get more shit in your utility belt, dog. Why not? Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Mm -mm. And you want to take us on out of here? Yes, absolutely. Thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Uh, please drop those comments down below. Let us know what you guys think about today's conversation. Let us know, uh, yeah, what you guys are, you know, kind of putting your dollar towards to improve your body. Uh, we'd like to hear all of it so that way maybe we could talk about it on a future episode. And uh, make sure you guys like today's video and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed. Uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project all over the place. My Instagram is at I'm Andrew Z and Sima. Where you at? And Sima Inyo on Instagram and YouTube and Sima Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Discord's below, Mark. $500,000 on recovery. What is he getting? No. That's what, that's really what I'm. Well, again, this shit adds up. He's pretty big. I wonder how mm. much a personal chef is that cooks every single meal for you because these guys are paying for that at least, mm. right? We should and then a bunch of other coaches. We should get one here. Yeah, I think Ian's setup is is pretty like you know high level too. <laughs> yeah. And I think from what I saw, I went out and saw his facility. I mean, he used to train like Tyson and Brady and like I mean. Shit. Ian Danny's a legend, but uh, these guys were getting like pre-workout drinks and post-workout drinks. And it was like specific to that guy, mm-hmm. specific to that person's metabolism, to their blood work. And like, they'd have a shake ready for them when they were mm-hmm. done. And it's just, you know, they're getting a meal plan and they're getting someone that uh, does body work on them. They're getting someone that is taking them through mobility work, strength training, the list of shit goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. I'm at Mark Smilly Bell. Catch you guys later. Bye.